Beyond Meat reporting mixed quarterly results, but the stock took a real hit after the company announced a secondary share offering. Joining us now to discuss is pre-IPO investor Brett Thomas, co-founder of Kavu Ventures and early investor in Beyond Meats. Brett, great to have you with us. Are you uh, still currently in Beyond Meats? We are. Yep. Are you Absolutely. planning on selling uh, your stake? No, we, we are in a position now where we made a long-term bet in this, right? Um, it's not a trade. It's not a short-term phenomenon, right? People aren't going to go back and wake up and say, we want more processed meats in our diet, right? So <clears throat> we're long-term holders, and we're very excited about the future this company so has. Walk us through the secondary share offering and what, what the thinking of an early investor might be in Beyond Meats, because you have stated that you believe in the long term of this company, yep. and so therefore you're holding on. Yep. Three million of these shares are being sold by insiders, and I understand that, that there are a whole host of reasons, including needing liquidity, they, this position may have be, become outsized because of the run-up in the stock, et cetera. Yep. But if you're a true long-term believer, yep. shouldn't you stay in this company? Yeah, no, listen, I think whenever you have a great profit, right, and, and obviously with a $12 billion market cap or wherever it is this morning, an unbelievable outcome so far, right, in a very quick period of time. So any wise investor would always trim along the ways, right? No matter how much long-term conviction you have, you always have to take something off the table, right? I actually think the secondary is a good thing. I think, listen, it's maybe 5% of the float. It increases the float in this company, right, makes it a little bit more investable. And if you have a disparate view in the company, you don't have to pay 100% borrow rate. Maybe it eases up the short. You're worried about processed meat. This is 100% processed. <laughs> what, you think many It's 100% <laughs> fake. There's not one thing natural uh, about it. So I don't see how that, that PC uh, sort of virtue signaling thing. Well, listen, how does I, that work with Beyond Meat? When If you're worried about GMOs, which actually have done some really positive things for, for right. a lot of different right. food classes, right. then why would something that you actually construct from chemicals be, well, listen, be it's, more... It's, it's plant-based, right? So it's, it, I'll give you, it's a little higher in sodium than traditional patty, right? Higher in fat, higher uh, in calories, uh, higher in price. Comparable in both of those. It will go to price parity. If you look at the new Dunkin' Donuts launch, right, uh, in New York here, their breakfast sausage sandwich is on parity with price with is that the original because sausage. Of, is that because Beyond Meat has cut its price, or is that because Dunkin' Donuts is eating the cost? I think it's a little of both, right? Okay. And I think uh, long term, though, the goal is to get the price to parity with real patties, right? I think the biggest thing people miss in the Beyond Meat story and they don't talk enough about is the social impact. So if you look at the IPO and the small flow, right, which has created this big move, ESG investing, right, a lot of that stock went to ESG social impact holders, right? So I don't want to be dismissive yep. of the ESG element, and I think it's real. Yep. But what I don't understand is to, to, to really have a market cap of this magnitude, you're going to have to grow into that. I 100%. think we all agree with yep. that. But the question is, no matter whether you're an ESG investor or you don't care about anything or you don't care about any of these issues, there's, there's math behind this. Yeah. So the question is, when do you think that to the degree it has to grow into this, this kind of valuation, when do you think that happens? Listen, I think... Is this a 10-year story? No, listen, I think, listen, meat is the biggest category in food, right? It's $1.4 trillion. If you use the same logic in plant-based dairy, right, captured about 15% of the dairy market, you know, UBS put a note out the other day, and by 2030, they think it's an $85 billion market in the U.S. So first of all, I'd say huge addressable market, big TAM, first mover advantage. And you think about the food and service... I'm sorry, can you back up on the numbers? Yep. Meat is a total of one point, what billion dollars? 1.4 trillion globally. 1.4 trillion, category. and, and yep. UBS is saying 85 billion. Just in the U.S. alone, potentially US by alone. 2030. So you have a huge addressable market. They are the first mover, and the advantage of being a first mover, you know, their guidance they right. raised to 240 right this year, you know, probably goes higher, right? How do you think it compares to Impossible? In terms of, I think the Taste, quality, product, a lot of people will tell you that Impossible is a better burger. Uh, from taste or nutritionals? Because Impossible is not, is not non-GMO, right? So, and, and Beyond is, right? right? I think they are coming out with a version. There's going to be multiple players in this category. I think it's big enough for it. Tyson's going to be launching theirs soon. Well, that was my question. When did, the, when did the traditional guys jump in? I mean, this is sort of like a little bit like people have compared this to Tesla. You know, at some point, the, the, big, the big car companies are going to be competing in, re, in, yep. in, for, in electric cars with yep. these guys. Yep. The Tysons of the world, the other, you know, the, the other big agriculture companies jump in. So. Yep, 100%. And I think Tyson's launching one soon. Nestle's out there with, with a product in Europe and the U.S. Um, you know, I think some of their products are kind of a, a hybrid, which part plant, part the real thing. Um, I just go back to the first mover advantage with, look at Dunkin' Donuts, 9,000 stores in the U.S., right? You're not going to, if you're Dunkin' Donuts and you're happy and same store sales are growing, you're not taking that out. And look at all the other retailers. It could be a domino effect. They're all going to have to have some type of offering at some point.